let's start from the beginning, James. Sure, uh, anything, Steve, whatever, how you want to handle it. Having read your book, you mentioned you kind of born to fly. Your dad was a, a pilot in World War I. The war ended before he could go overseas and fly. But what's your earliest memories of flying? Well, Steve, I can remember back to the age of five, uh, maybe even before that. Uh, the 1929 stock market crash, I don't remember it, but that's when it happened when I was four. And uh, I know how it affected most of the people in, in, uh, in the United States at that time. It really affected us farmers back in Arkansas and uh, other states are there all around us because of the Depression days. It was tough. And I was young enough to remember that because of our having to work even when we were five, six, seven, eight, uh, sometimes stay out of school half a semester or so to work on the farms when we should have been in school. But uh, I, I do remember that. My dad was, like you say, he graduated from Kelly Field, Texas at in 1917. And uh, he, the war armistice was signed before he could go to France. So uh, he got out and, of course, took over the, our farm, my, his dad's farm, near uh, out of Little Rock, Arkansas, about 20 miles. They were sharecroppers, right? Did well, they not really farm, sh or? sharecroppers. My granddad owned it, but uh -huh. he turned it over to my dad, so dad actually really was in cust custody uh -huh. of it. And that's where I was, uh, yeah, I was, we did a lot of uh, sharecropping <laughs> and working on a hot sun, and I'd only dreamed of flying, a burning desire to fly, because he taught me the the rudiment, rudiments of flying, theory of flight, uh, aerodynamics of all kinds. He was teaching me this. But he built a little model that I could sit in and work the controls, the ailerons, rudder, elevators, and whatnot. So uh, I, he taught his brother to fly. And his brother, uh, my Uncle Henry, ran the Missouri Pacific Bus Company in Little Rock, Arkansas. So he bought a little airplane, a little for, like a forerunner of a J3 Cub almost, tandem front and back. But anyway, he flew down to the farm. Dad built a little strip there. And uh, I could remember my first flight. It was just after I was five or so years old. So it was about six. I made close to six. And I, that's all I knew already had my goal set for life. Hmm. I knew I would not accept anything else than be become a pilot, be a pilot. Now, I, I didn't anticipate war and all of its devastation. Right. But for 44 years, I flew and plied the skies of the world after becoming a pilot, the youngest pilot, I believe, in military history, because mm -hmm. I was graduated from three Army Air Corps schools and could wear three sets of wings and fly B-17 four-engine bombers while I was still 18 years old. I went over to England, uh, my crew and I, we flew the B-17 across the Atlantic uh, we picked up a new B-17G at Kearney, Nebraska. What, uh, what year? And, and that was April 1st, 1944, mm -hmm. that I picked up the airplane. And obviously the war in Europe was blazing Blazing the away yeah. then, blazing yeah. away. And they really needed crews bad at that uh -huh. time because the 8th Air Force was taking a beating from the Luftwaffe. Mm -hmm. but, uh, believe it or not, know your enemy's strength. And if you study your enemy, know his strengths, and you can overcome a lot of the... Even though, even though they had uh, synthetic fuel with the FW-190s, ME-109s, Heinkel 210s, Heinkel JU-88s, uh, they were masters. I mean, they didn't know what, we could go 25 missions and you've done your tour, come back home in the training command. The German pilots didn't know what a tour of duty was. It was forever until they were killed or shot out of the sky practically. Uh -huh. The Goring's boys. The fat Abbeville kids, yellow noses, I remember them very well. But they're great pilots. Uh, yeah. they, they, their, whole, their whole system, uh -huh. a, a country not even as big as Texas, came very close, so close to winning World War II that it's, it boggles the mind to think about it. Hitler, it was Hitler's mistake. He made too many mistakes because he was on the verge of insanity anyway. Too many fronts to fight. Too, too many fronts. When he opened the front against Russia, that yeah. was his really a downfall. Uh -huh. But anyway, when I arrived in England, Colonel Barry, James F. Barry of West Point, came up to me and did like this to my cheek. And he says, my God, w w you don't even shave. <laughs> and he says, uh, can you fly that airplane? I said, sir, we just flew it across the Atlantic. He says, we'll have a check ride tomorrow morning, oh, 0800 hours. 
Yes, sir. And you were trained at a co as a co-pilot at I this point. I was trained point. initially as a, as a co-pilot, uh -huh. but I could, you know what, I passed the flight test uh -huh. as first pilot and aircraft commander. Right. But you had to have a certain number of hours in type uh -huh. before you could become an aircraft commander right. or first pilot. I didn't have that number of hours. So he gave me a check ride the next morning, came back down, and he said, I, I have never had anyone, any pilot, fly an airplane like that. And here you are, an 18-year-old kid, 18. not even with a high school degree, right. and you're going to be a commander of a, that, a That's a right. He says, I, at that time, he made me an unlimited aircraft commander and check pilot mm -hmm. for the 91st Bomb Group, 1st Wing, 1st Division of the 8th Air Force at Bassingbourne, mm -hmm. where the movie 12 O'Clock High yes. took place, yeah. uh, the Triangle A on the tail. We, had, uh, we, we got two presidential unit citations, the group did, the citation with an oak leaf because of some of the raids. And I made, you know what, I, I uh, led the group, 91st Bomb Group, on two missions over Germany and obliterated the targets. The photographs showed that we obliterated the targets. I got two bronze stars for, for that. And, uh, I, and, you know, it was absolutely amazing to, to take off from Bassingbourne on a foggy day Foggy morning when you couldn't hardly see 200 feet down in front of the airplane, the white line, and, and you take off and you climb up through the solid stuff to about 8,000 feet and you go to the flasher beacon one and then you go to the, the wash where we used to assemble the group to start out over France and Germany. But, you know, it was uh, amazing. Thousands of aircraft. Some One day we put up 2,400 bombers My God. out of England over France and Germany. Now. Now, you can imagine what the German people, if you're over Germany, they, they see these massive formations coming with condensation trails streaming off the, the empennage and, and the engines because the 30,000 feet, at six miles up, your oxygen mask would, would freeze up on you. So you take it off, beat it on the control column, put it back on. Mm -hmm. uh, and you could, when the, when the uh, you know, it's a good thing. I had four, I could fill four positions on that B-17 hmm. as a pilot, co-pilot, radio operator, and aerial gunner. So I, I, doing those positions and knowing what they're supposed to do, I, we were able, my, my plane got credited for shooting down more uh, German fighters than any other in the, in the group. Now you've uh, flown a lot of planes in your life. But what Over was 150 it? different types. What about the B-17 you really loved? Well, the B, it was a shame, uh, Steve, to, to utilize such a beautiful flying machine to kill people and mm -hmm. to bomb, uh, disintegrate cities. That's what we did. Right. We, we, we had to do it because the fascists, the Nazis, we had to eliminate them. Otherwise, the freedoms that we know when, 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 when the, your country calls you to defend itself for God and country, that's what most of us did that left the farms, the families, the villages, and cities all across America. Mm -hmm. I would do it again if I had to at my age right now, 80, mm -hmm. because there, I've lived and flown in over 120 countries of the world. I've applied the skies of the world, and I've, I've, ne I've always a lot of beautiful places, but there is no other country in the world from the Pacific to the Atlantic, from the Canadian border to the Mexican border, that has what God has graced this country with, bountiful with everything mm -hmm. that's good, and our freedoms are being still chewed away right now, I'm sorry to say. Yeah. And I'm 80, and for those 44 years, about 20 of those years was spent doing what? Fighting wars mm -hmm. in other continents, in, 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 in the Southeast Asia, in China, in Africa. I've been through coups in Africa. For 12 years I flew over there. Uh, not tw 11 years in Southeast Asia. And uh, all the wars during World War II and since, except the Gulf War. I was not involved in that. Well, let me back you up yeah, just a little bit. Um, go ahead. You know, reading your book, yeah. you know, I, I don't think people realize what the casualty rate of the 8th Air Force was at that time. Um, what was the casualty rate? Almost 50%, right? Oh, right. Uh, Steve, they were, they were i tell you what, not only B-17s, but of what, if it hadn't been for our strategic daylight bombing, uh -huh. the RAF bomb at night, we bombed by day. But we could bomb, I mean, we could, you know what my bombardier could do from 30,000 feet, that six mile with a Norton bomb site? 
He could cross, and I could set it up at 160 miles indicated airspeed, 30,000 feet right on the nose. I would turn on the AFCE, the automatic flight control system. And then the Nord bomb site would take over on the, as he approached the target. And man, this, it, it calculated everything. Mm -hmm. Those, he could drop a, a, a bomb in a rain barrel, almost from, from 30,000 feet. Mm -hmm. So we could, and, and by the way, when they threw up those flak barrages and the tracking flak and the stationary barrages, we had to fly through this stuff. Mm -hmm. And you could look out at the horizon, it'd be solid black, like a black curtain, puffs of black smoke. And then you could see the puffs of white. Uh, I was afraid of the black flak, but I was also more afraid of the white phosphorus. Why? Because if that exploded and pieces of it, shrapnel would hit your airplane, it would set it on fire. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, I don't know how they could do it, but they did it. And they were knocking airplanes out of the... I counted personally on one mission into Germany, 24 four-engine bombers that I saw personally shot down. The tour was 25 flights. Uh, initially, they raised to 30. Right. But I, I, I volunteered for a second tour of duty before I finished my 25. What was going through your mind about volunteering for a second tour? I told the colonel, yeah. he says, you know what the odds are, Colonel Barry. And I said, well... Well, sir, the war isn't over. I was trained to do a job, uh -huh. and I love it. What I don't love about it is dropping bombs on innocent men, women, and children. But we have to do it. <music> July 8, 1944, for the previous few missions, I was checking out new crews in combat that had never been in combat before. They gave me a new crew the night before, and I met them. And I said, well, we're going, I think it'll be a mission over France, and it won't be too bad. Famous last word. <laughs> anyway, I will say this. Uh, Lieutenant Bridwell and his crew, the next morning, we went to briefing, and then out to the fl plane, and took off, Climbed up, we assembled over the wash, went over to uh, France, and that was about 7.30 in the morning, finally, a beautiful sunny day. We were 23,000 feet, and we turned on the IP because the Nazis, the Panzer Division, the Tiger tanks were assembling to try to go in to stop the onslaught of the Allies that were trying to break through. And our job was to create this <coughs> area to uh, and knock them out so that they could have an easier ch time going into Paris. Right. Ally. Well, all of a sudden, uh, I looked out at the left wing, and I felt something before it happened. I looked out at the left wing, and I saw a hole in between number one and two engine, and the, the metal of the aluminum wing was curling and melting. Mm -hmm. And I knew there was no way to put the fire out. It was from flak then? Uh, it was yeah. from the direct hit with either 88 or 105 right. hit me in the body of the wing. Uh -huh. So I, I said, I got on the intercom, bail out, bail out, it's on fire. It could blow any minute. Get out now. And these new crew had never been in mission before. They started leaving an airplane like rats leaving a sinking ship. Mm -hmm. Boy, they were just like they'd been in, you know, knew exactly what to do. And they right. did. And my co-pilot, of course, Bridwell, I pulled in, and Man, let me tell you. It was, well, of course, I I'd pulled out of the formation because I, I didn't want to blow up anybody else because right. I've seen B-17s actually explode and take out a few airplanes with them. Right. Uh, and I'll tell you, if you're, when you're sitting there, you know they say there's no atheists in foxholes. There's no atheists in cockpits of bombers or fighters either. No. Uh -huh. Not at that time. Oh yeah, well he got out. They, we all got out of the airplane. Uh -huh. But you know, we came down, he came down in this uh, field, uh, in a farmer's field. I came down in one, and a 17-year-old French lad was plowing with his horses, mules, out in the field. And he told me, uh, he saw me, I picked up my chute, I was violently sick, but I picked up my chute, and I know I did the 200-yard meter dash in a, uh, faster <laughs> than anybody's ever done it. And I hid in these woods, and he did like that. And about an hour later, he brought back his father's clothes. His father died some months before. Mm -hmm. He brought his father's clothes to me, and I, I stripped right there, put on his father's clothes in these woods, and then I gave him my 45, my police special 38, and I told him, well, Make good use of them. Because <laughs> if you, yeah, you had them, you would have been yeah, yeah. shot on sight. Uh, yeah. That would probably got me anyway. Yeah. So they took me to his house, farmhouse. Now, you know what? No greater love than this, that a man risks his life for a friend or gives his life for a friend. Now, Maurice Duval, 
a 17-year-old French boy, risked not only his life, but that of his family's in order to help me save mine. Why? Because he didn't like the Bosch either. Mm -hmm. Now, Hitler said there are terror fleegers. That's what Hitler named us. Terror fleegers means terror flyers because we were literally leveling the cities in Germany. Right. So he said kill them. Now, what do you think they would do to 26 of us? Now here, I was with, joined up with the Mac French Underground, the Maquis. Now, we worked our way from Coudray Village near Drew into the underground headquarters in Paris. I was picked up in a Citroen, a black Citroen, with a, a French driver and a red-haired French lady. Now, here's a new, uh, practically a new Citroen driving through France at the war, at this place at the height of the war, and I was starting to think myself, wait a minute. You're set up, yeah. I'm, something is wrong. But I, Chat Boyd was with me, my radio operator, Gunner, on my airplane. I, I said, Chat, I just told him myself, something is not right. But we waited up at Gestapo, I mean, the, uh, underground headquarters. So one evening, we were supposed to fly back to England. There was finally 26 of us, American airmen, in civilian clothes, and we climbed on these two trucks, and we were supposed to fly out to this airstrip to be flown back to England. But you know where we ended up? Gestapo headquarters. 26 Allied airmen, American airmen, and oh my gosh, I, they raised the door and said, Bar Connoisseurs, Englanders, Ralph Schmidt, Hans Zook. Man, I reached for the sky as high as my arms could go. I have never seen so many searchlights, machine guns trained on me in my life. Mm -hmm. my life. And they took me into where they interrogated me, where they beat the hell out of me, and go to, said they are going to execute me in two days by a firing squad. And that was to go back now. Three, three weeks later, huh, the Allies broke through. Right. And they marched on Paris. So the Nazis had to evacuate. So that's why they took us down to the train station. I, I weighed 188 pounds, 87 uh -huh. or so, when I was shot down, July 44. I came out of Buchenwald, finally weighing less than 100. Now, Buchenwald was a death camp, but it was more of a labor it camp. It was more of a slave. They didn't have yeah. a gas chamber in right. Buchenwald. They, had, they killed people left and right. They killed 8,000 Russian soldiers while I was there. Right. They killed 3,000 little children while I was there and, and burned them in the crematorium. The crematorium was going night and day. Uh -huh. The smoke was so ashes, and it was, the stench was so bad, Steve, that I still have it in my nostrils today. Huh. Because when the wind direction changed, Another way, we got a little relief. But when the wind came back and it came over our camp where we out in the open, Steve, you won't believe the stench of, of, of bur human bodies burning. Mm -hmm. And you know, some, you know, they even burned some of those. They were out because they were, they were either in injected with something, but they threw some, uh, I say threw them. They had over 12, bur fern 12 uh, burners. And they would have little tracks going up to them with this thing that could push the bodies into the cream into the ovens, and and then burn them. Now you were there with what a hundred American flyers? And there, without no, there was eighty-two American airmen in all of World War II. Two died in Buchenwald. Uh -huh. Lieutenant L. C. Beck, a P-47 pilot who I met on the box car, cattle car, from Paris to Weimar, right. he died there. And then Royal Air Force Flight Officer Hemmings, Hemmings, he was a Spitfire pilot. He died. So the two of us out of the 168 died in Buchenwald. When I told you, going from the depths of hell, experiencing what the depths of hell must be like to the height of heaven, because when we got into the hands of the Luftwaffe, they were German. But we could laugh and talk with them. We couldn't do that with the Gestapo or ISS. Because they were fellow pilots and they respected The camaraderie with yeah. pilots. Yeah. Hermann Goring was a pilot in World War I. Mm -hmm. now, Hermann Goring didn't want to be hung at the Nuremberg trials, so he bit down on the cyanide pill and killed himself, which was slipped to him by some Ameri American. Anyway, uh, he, uh, when he learned that there were American or Allied airmen in a concentration camp, they said he turned livid. Now, he sent two of his men to Buchenwald to specifically take us to a prisoner of war camp. So after four months in the depths of hell, or what it must be like. Right. I experienced the height of heaven 
still in the hands of Germans, but now I'm a prisoner of war. As a prisoner of war, the Luftwaffe couldn't have treated us any better. I'll tell you why. Stalagluf III was a spa, a resort, <laughs> in comparison to Buchenwald. Oh, yeah. When you are starving to death, Steve, and I hope it don't happen to anyone, that, you know, it's the most horrible way to die. How much weight did you lose in the Close to 100 pounds. Close to 100. So it went down from 187 to 87 I was pounds. I was skin and bones. In I could Buchenwald. hardly walk when I stumbled out of Buchenwald on the arm of this Luftwaffe officer with that iron cross around his neck. So the point is, I have experienced man's inhumanity to, to, to man in the worst light possible. I have experienced it. I know what it's like. And you know what? I've experienced genocide and seen it now in Africa, in, in the Rwanda, in various places in Africa, in Sudan. And I've, I, I built an air division in Sudan for Chevron Oil Company. And I would fly down to Muglad, Bin Tu, southern where the Christians are, and the Nation of Islam, the Muslims, control the Khartoum, and, and they started slaughtering the Christians back a long time ago in the right. yeah. So the point is, I've witnessed it all over the world, and yet we still don't learn from our mistakes. Now, we have to defend ourselves if we are attacked. Right. We, and I love this country. As I told you before, I've, I've lived all over the world, and I've seen all cultures, cultures, all societies, but there is nothing like these soil of these United States. Now, what did Eisenhower and Patton and Bradley and these people do when they liberated those concentration camps? They cried like babies. Hmm. Why? Because how can a culture such as the German culture, Bach, Beethoven, Brahms, Liszt, uh, Goethe, all the great writers and composers, PhDs, BA, sit down at drafting tables and design a better way to kill their fellow man. Mm. Huh? It, it's it's, it's mind-boggling. And, and it's yet, not just Germans. It's men it, killing men. It's men killing, killing men. It, um, it, humanity it's killing humanity. humanity. So if they can do it there, they can do it anywhere. Men it, are capable it, of rationalizing anything. Ab absolutely. And you've seen it over and over again in different countries, yep. different cultures. Absolutely. So Steve. it's nothing to do with... Uh, in, in Nigeria, Steve. Yeah. I built an airline in Nigeria called Arax Airline. Right. I also built a... Uh, Air, uh, air division for uh, uh, mobile oil in, in Nigeria. Now, in Nigeria, there's so many tribals, tribal uh, uh, villages, and they will go and attack each village. Each, they will fight each other, and they have different scars on their faces to determine which tribe they're from. Now, January 26, 1945, I turned 20. <laughs> the next day, January 27, at midnight, they force marched us out of Stalaglu 3, 15 degrees below zero, cold, snowing. And I had just gotten back enough strength to start to where I could get around a little bit. How long are you, had you, were you in Buchenwald? Till uh, Nove we October, were in, uh, November? Yeah, four months total uh -huh. in the Gestapo and SS, four months. From in, May, no. From yeah, July, July 11 to October 20. You were in Buchenwald. Yeah. 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 And then October 20 on, we were in uh, Stalingrad 3. And then when the Russians got close, as I say, they forced March of January 27, 45, on this long trek to Nuremberg. Uh, 14,000 prisoners, Gefangeners, on a long, uh, uh, maybe four abreast on this highway. And a lot of the guys <coughs> were still wounded. A lot of guys were in still bad shape. We marched and marched and marched. Finally, you know where we had to get? In a pottery factory in barns. And anywhere we could find shelter with the cattle, horses, or where we could uh, sort of try to get out of the weather a little bit. But a lot of guys died on it, and a lot of the German guards died. It was, a, it was a, a march that would go down in history like Bataan Death March of the Philippines. How many days was it? Uh, we marched for over two, two weeks. And finally they had uh, uh, some cattle cars again to take us on to Nuremberg. Uh, and the Nuremberg was, uh, uh, the Americans got close. Right. So they forced marches to Moosburg. So here we go, out marching again. So when the Russians get close, they force marches. When the Americans get close, they force marches. <laughs> so, I, you and know And they what? can't be very good camps for 14,000 uh, oh, prisoners. No, hey, hey, you know, they, must, the they horrible, didn't have the food. The most horrible conditions that you can think of. Uh -huh. and, and words will never be able to describe it. Right. Uh, you know, 
When you see little children killing each other, 5 to 12 years old, over a piece of molded bread, when you see Russian soldiers kill each other after they stole from each other uh, a piece of uh, bread or something, that, that, uh, th then you know uh, how bad it can get. Yeah. It, it, it's so, you know what, I wanted to resign from the human race from what I witnessed. Yeah. Because how is it possible that we can still have so, many, so much hatred and prejudices and animosities, jealousies, greed, anger, hatred, no matter a child. A child doesn't know anything. You know? But yet they were stripped from their father's and mother's arms, huh. separated, never to see their father and mother again, put in gas chambers, killed, both, ever, never to see each other. So back, back to yeah. being liberated, what happened? you just remember Patton uh, coming in? I remember when he, he came in and I got to shake hands with him. Uh. and not, not for long because a lot of people want to shake hands with him. But uh, they took, uh, finally they took us uh, out to the, where the, uh, they said, well, you can go into town, but don't, but don't go very far, you know, and just look around. And I did, and I ran into a lot of these young German boys. They were boys, mere boys in German uniforms because they'd used up everybody else. Right. When did your parents find out that you were actually alive? When I arrived at Stalaglu 3 in October, latter part of October in 44, we were able to write letters and uh -huh. able to send uh, letters then. So I wrote as soon as I got there. That I, and, and, the, and the adjutant general sent them a cable that I was finally a prisoner of war. Had they lost after faith at that point? Did, uh, they, did they assume you were dead? After they, they thought I was killed in action, yeah. What was it like to see your parents in Arkansas after you'd gone through all that? It was, it was good, except I was never the same. I was never that little farm boy with hayseeds in his hair. I could never be the same after what I witnessed and went through personally because of... I've, I've, I've had the first, second, third encounters with dying and death, both natural, man-made, and by the so-called enemy that you're fighting. I, I've seen it all, and, and, and it isn't pretty either way, but it, it's, all, it's all one thing that we, we do get old, we do die uh, a natural death uh, when we die, when God calls us. However, it can be hastened. Right. It can be brought about pretty quick oh, yeah. uh, by your enemy. Uh, so-called enemy. I don't, you know what, I have no animosity or angry or uh, anger in my heart for anyone, for any member of the human race now, knowing what a lot of us have to go through and what a many so billions of them are going through today. Hunger in Africa, uh, hunger in Southeast Asia, uh, hunger in many places of the world. Uh, they just can't get enough food. They, they're, they don't, they don't, the children, are, they don't choose where they're born. They're born there. If you're born in the, in the sub-Sahara or where there's no water or if you're born where there's no food grows or where it can't grow, yet you have to do the best you can. Right, you don't have any choice. No yeah. choice. Yeah. So of, did you American have, people don't know how good we have it. Did and you have trouble adjusting to civilian life? After I did coming back because when I heard of all of the people complaining about uh, uh, how they had to get by on nothing and how everything was rationed and, and all this and... and, and, and Yet nobody starved. Nobody was on a starvation diet right. here. I was on a starvation diet. I didn't listen to, oh, big, couldn't get tires or gas or uh, butter or, you know, ration. Things are rationed. I, I, I couldn't listen to it anymore. Having been and you know what? To convey, in Wall, yeah. to convey what I went yeah. through, I, I, I gave up because, if, uh, you know, most of them remained silent. The 81 Americans that came back that lived through it, only five of us, out of that number, were able to continue in a profession or work in their profession. Me as a pilot, because most of them mentally had broken down, yeah. physically and mentally. I've had them visit me here in the Springs. Uh, Park Chapman, uh, uh, my, my, bum, my uh, gunner, Errol Gunner, Chat Bowen, and many others come to visit, and they break down crying in 30 seconds or minute once we start talking about it because they couldn't couldn't think about go through it again what we went through there it was so awful even I, and you know why I, I I still I, I have I, can, I shed tears uh -huh. 
I wake up at night in nightmares. I just had one the other night back in Buchenwald. Mm. I woke up in a cold sweat. I had to change the sheets mm. because it was just like real, just like yesterday. I in fact, if you go through something like that so mind-boggling and it happens to you, uh, you, 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 uh, you live with it. And you know, today, today, every day, I can't go out to a fine restaurant and, and enjoy a good meal. Why? Because I've lived and flown in so many places where they don't have it. And then you went to back, you went to China. I went to China, In 1947 yeah. Yeah, during right. the uh, yeah, I had, Communist I had Revolution. Civil War there. Yeah, Civil War. Yeah. That was, uh, you know, I, I always wanted to meet some of the AVG, the Flying Tigers, and I met all the, those that were still living that survived it, right. like Tex Hill, uh, like uh, uh, Dick uh, Rossi, the movie Jim Bledsoe, huh. Tex, uh, uh, Cat Catfish Rains, uh, Pappy Boyington, huh. Pappy Boyington of the, of the uh, Baba Black, Black Sheep. Yeah, Black Sheep. Was, he was a... He was with the Tigers. They were flying again with the Tigers yeah, again in, and, in the uh, 40s? No, in no, late 47, uh, 48? No, no, no. The, the, he was with the original. Yeah. Tigers. That was, uh, uh, let's see. who The one I, was, I flew f with, uh, uh, Bill Hobbs, uh, met many of them, but I got to fly with all the guys. I, I named them in my book, I believe, a lot of them. And uh, it was uh, one of my, again, I, I flew with, uh, in, in, uh, with CAT, Civil Air Transport. Right. Now, when Mao took over and Chenault had to leave the mainland to go over to Formosa, Taipei, uh, he, uh, Chiang Kai-shek and the Nationalist government, I think they killed about 28,000 Formosans in order to set up his son uh, government on Formosa. So the, uh, the island of Taiwan actually belongs to China. We really right. island, island. But we've been backing uh, since since the, the height of the Civil War and after, uh, we've been backing the Nationalists against Mao. He was a communist, of course. And uh, that was uh, uh, to, to see uh, that all happen. I, I left there, of course, in December of 48 before Mao took over China. Now, here you had spent uh, almost uh, s uh, three or four months in, in England flying over Germany and yeah. being shot at in yeah. B-17s. Oh, yeah. But now you're back in combat, in a sense, right? Because you're being shot at delivering supplies. Um, you know, what, what's, what's going on through your head at the time? I mean, you're seeing war close up again. You're saying you're transporting uh, wounded uh, Chinese uh, soldiers good as well. Good question, Steve. It's a good question. I, 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 answer, answer truthfully, I love flying. Right. I, and you know what? I didn't have the choice, really, to choose my own because I had been involved in this type of thing so long and I knew it. I set up uh, airdrops with sh conventional shoots uh, and free fall and all the other types of tactics that's being used right now right. in the Army, in the Air Force. Uh, in Laos, I set it up in 60, 61, 61, and 62. I could put a, on the size room of this room, I could put it on a mountaintop, whatever they wanted. Now, Weapons were you essentially were employed by the CIA at this point? I never was signed a contract with uh -huh. them, Steve, which is why I could write my book. Right. I would never have been able to write it if I had signed a contract. Right. Uh, I was flying for U.S. aid for international development. Right. You say. Uh -huh. And then I was flying for the CIA. In fact, the day I was shot down, I was on a special mission for the CIA. I had bought this F-51 Mustang, right. two of them, and one of them was beautiful. Only had about 100 hours total time on the airframe and engine, so I had it. It was I, it was beautiful, uh, and I, 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 I it was Castro was in the Sierra Maestra mountains then. Was he only had about 10 men left? Right. But uh, I flew down there. I didn't fly my 51. I, I parked it in in uh, uh, Fort Lauderdale. But I landed and I saw these three F-51 Mustangs with the center sections burned out of them. I said, what? I asked somebody, what? what the? They said, well, those were F-51s and they were pilots training for Fidel Castro huh. in Cuba. Uh, I said, put mine in a hangar. 
<laughs> I didn't want to leave it sitting out because the hey, same thing would happen. So I put it in the hangar, and I went down to Miami, and I checked everything. And Castro's picture was up on several restaurants, you know, and, and I learned. Well, he was, uh, the United States was an ally of Castro. Uh, uh, we backed Castro, and we backed Batista at the same, same time. time. <laughs> That's, hey, you can't lose. One yeah. way is going to go, right? <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, the, uh, I, I started asking people, what's happening really in Cuba? And a lot of the, uh, they said, well, Batista is torturing little children, pulling their tongues out, gouging their eyeballs out, and, and torturing them with medieval instruments. And any time he thought someone was aiding or abetting or helping Castro, I said, wait a minute. Cuba is only 90 miles from Key West, Florida. Cuba is our neighbor. You mean to tell me that I listening to this and this is true and they proved it to me they proved it I was going to knock out Batista's airport at Havana airport because it was lined up like ducks it had been like shooting ducks in a rain barrel uh, I could have done it so easily but you know I flew down there with another little light airplane and I met Castro and I met Chick Raul River, yeah. uh, I met Raul Castro and I met Che Guevara you know Castro and uh, Castro was an idealist lawyer along with Camilo Cienfuegos. Now, Castro wanted what was best for the Cuban people. Raul's a Marxist. Che Guevara was a Marxist. Out and out, no question. Communist Marxist, out and out. But I saw that I believe that Castro would, would be able to win over something without you know, becoming a communist nation or Cuba. And I was going to help him any way I could. And you know who went me at the Havana Hilton Hotel? Earl Flynn. Earl Flynn, I'd never met him in my life. But he walked across there, and he, I don't know how he knew me. But he walked up and shook hands with me and said, where have you been? I said, well, I haven't been anywhere. I've been just trying to find out a lot of information. Well, he was going to do a movie on Castro's life. Really? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I, I went back and landed in Miami. And by the next, no, next day, all hell was breaking loose. Castro was able to take over Cuba about six, seven months before he planned. Huh. And I went immediately to Cuba, to Havana. And here I am out at the airport there, and Castro was there, and here's Che. All these guys are walking around in these green uniforms, and they'd live in the jungle, you know, in the woods, right. uh, you know, until you took over. <laughs> and, and they were preparing their own food, and they'd walk. You know, I couldn't speak Spanish. Uh -huh. I could say, hey, let's shoot that guy. And I'd probably say, okay, go ahead. You know? <laughs> but anyway, I, 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 I said, I've got to get out of here because uh -huh. I know this is, not my, uh, this is not my cup of tea. No. So Pedro Diaz Lanz became the chief of the Cuban Air Force. And he was a friend of mine. And I didn't get to see Castro as much as I, but I, I admired him. Uh -huh. I admired him, really, for what he did. Right. Landed over the Vasco de Gama uh, with 10 men, and finally he was able to overthrow Batista. Uh, you see, at that time, Americans owned most of Havana, met, uh, gambling, the mafia right. owned most of it. And the uh, United Fruit Company, the uh, mines, nickel silver mines, all various, they were owned by Americans, and Cubans worked for them for pe pe uh, as peons. Right. Castro wanted to stop that. Right. Now, the, the funny thing is, I didn't get to do anything. And so, I, 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 still, I still do that. Uh, che and Raul, what their position was. Well, they killed Camilo Cienfuegos. They got him out of the way in a plane crash. They killed him. And that left Castro alone. Then Castro with his men came up to New York and stayed in the hotel there. They cooked their own food and everything. And he came up to get to ask us for aid, for help right. from his uncle from the north, his neighbor. And this is the truth. We flatly turned him down. We didn't give him one red cent. He goes back to Cuba a little annoyed. And Ch Raul and Che then persuade him to go to the Russian bear. Right. So we actually pushed Castro into the Russian bear's arms.
Let's talk about your time in Laos. I mean, that's fascinating to me, the deal that was made with the Soviet Union. So talk a little bit about that, the, uh, the airport that the United you States You know, uh, I, when I landed in, six, in 60, first part of 61 in Laos, I, I was amazed at the Laotian people. In Vinh Chien Laos, you would not know that a war was being, go, uh, being fought in the hills and uh, uh, mountains in the, of Laos. Uh, it was so peaceful. The Laotian people were so peaceful. You could leave your door unlocked. You wouldn't, nobody would steal anything. Now, the Kong Li under the path at Lao was the left wing, and you had two brothers in Laos. You had Savannah Puma and Pumi No Savannah. They were stepbrothers. And somehow, one was left wing, and Savannah Puma was right wing. Pumi No Savannah was left wing. Now, we drove a wedge, sort of. Huh? We talk about nation building. This is where the nation building really started in, in Laos. Because the CIA and the USAID for National Development came in, and uh, really they ran the country as if it was their own. The government of Laos, under the tri or the other three headed elephant umbrella, that was a signal on the flag, they uh, took orders more or less from. <laughs> the Americans. So you, now, we, the airport, if you paid taxes in the 60s, early 60s, you helped pay for the airport in Vin, Watai Airport in Vinci and Laos. Now, we've made a beautiful airport out of it. But before it was finished, the Russians brought in about 30 of their own airplanes, and they took over the good part of the airport. We had to stay on where the other part was undeveloped yet and fly off the same airport. Now, we were flying for the left, uh, right wing. They were flying for the left wing. We were flying the right off the same airport. How how it really came about, I can't truthfully answer you, see, because I don't really know the full ramifications. I do know this: that agreement was made, that the they could fly for the left wing, we could fly <laughs> for the right wing, still off the same airport. And I still never and I would go over to the Russian uh, quarters. And they would put up sheets, and, and they, they'd put up these movies showing how, how the Russians uh, uh, propaganda for the Laotians to watch at night. Their whole compound would be full of Vietnamese. And here we are, and by the way, the compound we had was beautiful. I, I asked Bill Bird, I said, Bill, don't we, aren't we, we live in houses then. I said, can't we build a compound for us? He built a double deck, two-story compound, built it in an H shape with a swimming pool, Everything inside with a cafeteria. Oh, we had like a like the uh, like the Hilton, uh -huh. like the New York. <laughs> uh, anyway, it was nice. And uh, the Russians, I'd go over there, and you know what surprised me? Not one American could speak Russian. I could go over there, and over half of the Russians spoke English. Yeah. I was shocked. Right. They were. Really they, they were flying for peanuts. We were flying for Boku money. Right. Lots of money, in other words. Comparison. Without my faith, I would not, I repeat, I would not have been able to survive my ordeals. Mm -hmm. And I've been through many ordeals. And one, I think we haven't got to it, was when I was shot down in Laos, we'll January 5th, that. 1963. Yes. <laughs> I yeah. spent 27 hours on a mountaintop, Steve, with my leg gashed open to the bone, no skin on my thigh, my eye was burned closed, no hair burned off my head, no skin on my arms. And I came down, I came off of the top of this PV-2 less than a hundred feet from where it hit the side of the ridge. And I came down less than a hundred feet from the wreckage, just below the, the wreckage, where it, it plowed into a 60 degree slope. You know, Steve, I was there arguing with God. I came off this airplane with a conventional chute, not a ejection type seat chute. And I don't remember opening my chute. Huh. So don't tell me we don't have guardian angels or someone watching over each and every one of us. In our foolish ways, sometimes right. we do foolish things, oh, yeah. especially when we're young. As we get older, <laughs> we look back and say, hey, how, how did you do this? You or why that? did you do this? You know? but, but anyway, I said to her, I said, God, look, I'm dying. I'm dying. Why didn't you let me die in the wreckage? 
And you know what? I didn't hear an audible voice. But I did hear a small voice or something tell me to be calm. Be calm. And weren't uh, telling me what to do, more or less. I wrapped the small, uh, cut pieces of parachute that was left that wasn't burned, fixed my leg up, uh, wrapped it on my arms. Uh, you try to try to wrap in your arms when you got this whole skin right, on them, right. and, and 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 you're, are you, And there was a solid overcast, and you know, I I I, I threw it, and the, the the ammunition started going off of the airplane where it hit, burned, and there was bags of rice too. And all that was it, and when it was all finally calmed down, I worked my way slowly. Now I'm just below the wreckage, and it took me hours to work my way through this elephant grass that was sharper than a ra razor blade on, and I finally got up to the wreckage site. And I made me a little place to lay down. Uh, I had All I had to survive with was a little pen knife. And I still was arguing with him, and I said, Father, you know, the, the, in order for the search aircraft to find me, Air America, Bird and Sons, that was my company, uh, Dutch and I, my company, and, and, and they're going to be out looking for us, looking for us. And they won't be able to spot us with this overcast. Now, that evening came along at night, and you know, it's still solid. I says, Father, let me close my good eye. Let me look up and let me see a star. Now, if you let me see a star, then I know you're with me. You want me, you want me to survive. I close it 15 minutes later or so. I look up through, and I thought what I saw looked like a star. And then this happened. You've seen rapid sequence photography where the clouds go by real fast. Right. It's like someone took take their arm, took their arms and went. The clouds moved out with a thousand stars and the moon was thrown in also. Hmm. Amazing. I laid back on this little leafy pallet and thanking him for answering my prayer. And I said, Father, the pain is so bad in my back. I can't, I can't take it. Please let the pain go. Instantly. Instantly, Steve, the pain was gone. I said, Father, I'm thirsty. I'm so thirsty. I, 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 my lips were already parched. and I, I said, let the thirst go. Instantly, no thirst. And I said, you know what? Anything I felt like at that time I would ask for, he would answer it through his son. He huh. would answer it. And you know, I looked over and I saw this mountain. And I thought of us here. If you look up to this mountain which cometh my help, my help cometh from the Lord who made heaven and earth and all things. Mm -hmm. you, it can, it, if you ask it, ask, seek, and knock, you can make that mountain move. Whatever obstacles in your path, path. I felt strong. I felt, I jumped up. And I felt, even though I was dying, I felt like I, I had been imbued with uh, morphine, about 40 injections. <laughs> I felt like uh, that I could conquer the world. And yet here I am on this mountaintop dying. Right. right. You know, next morning, I hear this airplane coming up. It was a beat by our baron. But he turned left because they found my crew, two of my crew members. They found where I dropped them out about two minutes before I got out of the airplane finally. And uh, they, they didn't. So I heard another engine. So these were C-46 engines. Wait, I couldn't see it, but I could hear them. Now, this happened. The airplane would go at, would head west, turn around, go back east. And finally I said, now, Father, look, you've answered my prayers now. Now, have that aircraft, please, turn to the northeasterly heading. This is the only heading and only way they'll be able to spot me. Let it fly northeast. Let it fly northeast. And the two pilots that were flying the C-46, John, uh, Johnny McHale, uh, he was a pilot, and he told me, he's crying when he told me this later. Uh -huh. He said the, all the autopilots was taken out of the airplane right. because our missions in Laos would not last over two, two and a half, three hours, no more than that. Right. So he said the airplane turned left to a northeasterly heading, rolled out on the heading itself. Unbelievable. And rolled, yeah. and, it's, and I, all the time I felt like I was going through the earth. And at the same time, I could hear it. I knew, I didn't have to look up. I knew where the airplane was coming from. I knew, I knew where it was going to bank over. And it banked over, and they looked down and saw me by the wreckage. Huh. And they said, my God, there is Jim by the wreckage. But how could he get to the wreckage? It's on this 7,000-foot ledge, and there's no way he could climb to get there. And he couldn't have survived the crash. They didn't know that no one has ever come off of an airplane with a conventional chute that close. <laughs> to the ground. <laughs> oh, let me tell you, you know what? 
And they, in 15 minutes later, an Air America Jolly Green Giant helicopter hovered over me. They let down two cables. Man, let me tell you. I, you know, I don't know whether it, was, it had something to do with adrenaline, but it, he was still with me. Uh, they, let me uh, they pulled me up into the chopper, and the, and the chopper pilot was crying. And, his, and uh, I asked, well, what, what's he crying for? They said, well, he's picked up a lot of dead ones. You're oh, yeah. the first live pilot that he's picked up. No, my wife now, we have three children, and I have two sons and one daughter. My daughter is Lana Cave. She calls herself Fort Warcos. He was the Special Forces 21 years. Oh. Uh -huh. And uh, that's why I've been able to go. I went back to Germany, to Germany to visit him and them when we went back, back to France uh -huh. for, the, for the reunion with uh, Maurice Duval in 98. This anyway, is your son-in-law. Yeah, yeah, his son-in-law. His name is Jeff Warcos. He's a, now one of Colorado Springs' finest. He's been a... Colorado Springs police officer now for several years. Oh, terrific. Yeah, yeah he, he, no one, <laughs> he's a special forces 21 years. <laughs> Nobody lit it up as a police officer. Uh -huh. He's a good man. Yeah, so anyway, my son, his name is Roche Four. he lives in Denver, and my son, Jimmy Four, he's my youngest son. He's the director of banking and running Charles Schwab uh, organization in Denver, and Reno, and San Francisco. Ah, terrific. And here, he's a, he's a, He's overall, he's only 38, but he's in charge of all of it. And they're half Laotian and half, uh, or your wife's, uh, did My she wife, naturalize uh, she's from America? Sit, yeah, she's American, but she uh -huh. was born in Laos. Uh -huh. But she's uh, also part Thai uh -huh. in Laos, yeah. She was a part of the, uh, a member of the royal family. Her father was a top general in the Laotian army when the Japanese uh, took over China. Really? Or took over uh -huh. Laos, yeah. And he, he died of a, uh, a heart attack. Now, who controls the Laos country now? Is it a com communist? It is communist country. Yeah, it's communist. Yeah. It, they, but they, they're but trying to... you go to, back to visit, or...? Uh, I haven't been back since uh -huh. 70, no. Uh -huh. I would like to go back. In fact, I've been thinking about going back to, 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 to Laos and going up to Ban Hu Isai and going over to that mountain where I was shot down and somehow going back to that wreckage that's still there on that mountain, I know. Uh -huh. nobody, I know nobody's been... It's such a... It's such Remote a place, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's a boondocks. You would, no one would ever be there. But anyway, that's where I uh, was dead, but back alive. How many grandkids do you have? I have uh, two. Uh -huh. uh, two. I have two real grandchildren, a grandson and a granddaughter. Right. My granddaughter is Kayla, Kayla Kirkland Warcos, and uh, she's uh, 14 now, and she's into soccer and all kinds of athletics. She's an uh, honor student, all A's. Terrific. And she yeah. can't wait to be a doctor. <laughs> and she can quote you medical terms that I've never heard in my life. <laughs> yeah, and so you know what? I still, I still dream and, and want to fly. I, I, I just, I, I, but I can't. I got five flight simulators. I can fly the Concorde from. He throw London to On JFK. Your computer then, or yeah, and make it yeah. landing, bring in an instrument <laughs> probe. The Concorde. I've never flown it, but I can fly it just as good. And 747, 737, 77, all the airplanes they've got now. I can fly all of them. Well, and, ask, and real good. Let me ask you one final question. Yeah. What, what is it that you loved about flying? Well, I found out the first flight was I always thought that the Earth, you were earlier you're part of it. Then when you break the, when the wheels, the landing gear leaves that Earth, and you're free, you feel like, I know I feel like the birds that fly. I know that a lot of the fowls look down on the earth and, and, and laugh at us. Why can't those people <laughs> fly like we do? But you feel free. You feel like, you feel closer to God because you're, you are getting closer to him as you climb up. And I've never felt closer to him than when I'm flying. A lot of conversation I've had with him. I do most of the time, I'm listening. I, I mean, I do talking. I, I never heard, you know, audible voices, but I felt the presence. You feel the presence of God. And, and, and it's just like the uh, McGee that wrote, uh, uh, wrote that high flight. Yes. Yeah. Reached out my hand and touched the face of God. It's the last thing. Uh, that I experienced all over the world. And he, he's let me see his majestic handiwork from the Arctic to the hottest regions on earth, the coldest to the hottest. 
And there is beauty in all of it.